Hallelujah. Lift your hand to heaven, everybody. Let's give God the glory this evening. Let's give him the honor and celebrate him. It's worthy of praise. It's worthy of glory. It's worthy of honor. Make sure your voice of gratitude is heard on high as you connect to heaven with your heart. Melato pledian talago sidia. Thank him from the depth of your heart. Give glory unto his name. Give praise unto his name. Celebrate him for the privilege and the blessing of being in his presence. Make sure your voice of gratitude is heard on high as you give glory unto the name of the Most High God. Give praise unto him. Celebrate his faithfulness. His worthy of praise. His worthy of glory. His worthy of honor. His worthy of adoration. Thank him from the depth of your heart. Father, we say thank you. Blessed be your holy name. For the answers to prayers, we are grateful. For the testimonies we have heard, we are thankful. Now begin to ask him to speak to you this evening. Lord, I'm set to hear from you. Speak to me this evening. Speak to me this evening. The word for the moment. The word for the hour. Lord, I'm set to receive it this evening. Thank you, Father, for it. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Father, tonight we are before you with gratitude in our heart because blessed is everyone that you cause to approach you. And you do that that you may fill us with the goodness of your house. Therefore, tonight we ask that you fill us yet again. Amen. By your word, let everyone be changed and transformed. Amen. We give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' precious name we are praying. Amen. Somebody believe, say loud, amen. amen. Give Jesus a big hand and please, you may be seated in his presence i have dominion we have been looking at this line of teachings since last week in our midweek services entitled operating in the supernatural operating in the supernatural remember that for us this month of july has been themed i am redeemed a wonder to my world can we echo that together i am redeemed a wonder to my say it with conviction i'm redeemed a wonder say it like you are talking about yourself i am redeemed a wonder to my world that will be your experience in the name of jesus somebody believe it say loud amen now it's important that we recognize that the foundational reality of redemption is determined by our discovery of our recreation. Second Corinthians 5.17 says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For you to have a real experience of what redemption has to offer, you must discover the reality of your recreation. And it's important that we know what this nature that has been recreated in us by redemption has to offer let's recognize first of all that our recreated nature is what we call the nature of the supernatural we are not ordained to operate according to natural protocols or physical protocols let's recognize that every creation is limited by its nature or its capacity is determined by its nature think about this a man can walk, a man can run, but a man cannot fly. A bird can walk, a bird can run, and a bird can fly. The nature of each creation determines its limitation. It means that if you have been recreated by God, you need to rediscover the capacity of your new nature. And the capacity of your new nature is what the Bible refers to as the supernatural. It means the superior to natural. Whatever natural experiences or natural human beings have as their limitations, there is a superior experience ordained by you by your recreation. So if I'm redeemed by God, then I'm ordained by God to live a life that is superior to natural. It means that if I am limited to the natural, I am, limit, I am limiting my capacity in redemption. 
Is somebody getting what God is saying? If what happens to you is like what happens to others, there is something wrong with your experience of your, of your true nature in redemption. Because our nature in redemption is superior to what natural men should experience. This is why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church. And he said to them, he said, Where are, wherein there is all kinds of envy and strife and bitterness. He said, do you not walk like ordinary men? So it means that you are not to walk or operate like an ordinary man. You are not ordinary by any measure or any standard. By redemption, if you are in Christ, you have been recreated. You have been recreated and that recreation needs to be located in you in order for you to find it given expression in every department of life. Let's recognize that if you don't reprogram your mentality to see the reality of your recreation, you may be relegated to a life of obscurity. This is very important. You see, every time your environmental programming matters, if you find a lion that is kept in the midst of sheep, of sheep, it will lose its lion identity. Not because it lacks lion capacity, but because it lacks lion mentality. You see, the truth is this. You have a divine identity. You need divine mentality. You must begin to see the reality of what Christ has made you in redemption. The fact that you are not who you were you are not who you were. You are ordained by God to live a divine experience on the earth. And I pray that for each one of us, that will be our own experience in the name of Jesus Christ. This is why scriptures make us understand that we are created for signs and wonders. Because that's the realm of the supernatural. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. I and the children that the Lord has given unto me, he said they are for signs and wonders in Israel. So we are not to experience life as others do. We are to operate in life as signs and wonders. I love that because he did not say that you are just to command signs and wonders. He said, I and the children that the Lord has given unto me, we are for signs and wonders. Say with me, I'm a sign and I'm a wonder. Come on, say it louder like you mean it, I'm a sign and wonder. Say it like you mean it, I'm a sign and wonder. So it means that everybody should be able to look at you and see God at work. They should be able to look at your life and see God at work. Look at your family, see God at work. Look at the works of your hand and see God at work. You are supposed to be divine evidence manifested on the earth. That is God's ordination in redemption. That is why the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 19, it said the endless expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the unveiling or for the revealing of the sons of God. For the individuals that are not going to do it by explanation. But they do it by manifestation. You hear what Paul the Apostle said in the book of 1 Corinthians 2 beginning from verse 4. He said, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He said, but of the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Not explanation, demonstration. There are things you say and there are things you show. God is saying that by redemption, you are not just ordained to say, you are created to show. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, it says there, it said, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should do what? You should show, not say. You should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in other words, God is saying that there is a dimension that is bringing you to where you will not need to explain your salvation. You will demonstrate your salvation. Where you will not need to explain your association with God, you will demonstrate your association with God. Well, you will not need to say to somebody, I know God. They will see you and say, this man knows God. That will be somebody's experience from now. And that is why the Bible said in Zechariah 8 and verse 23, that 10 men of all languages of the earth will say, we will go with you. They will take hold to your skirt. That is, they are not saying, they are not just using their mouth to talk. They are holding you and saying, we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. 
That will be somebody's experience from now. Somebody believe it, say loud, amen. I said, somebody believe it, say loud, amen. What is God saying to you and to me? He's saying that we are ordained to operate in this realm of manifestation of our divine root. The Bible makes us understand that this is the only way that you and I are going to be able to actually give our world evidence that we truly are connected to God. Look at what Jesus said. John chapter 10, verse 37 and verse 38. Look at Jesus speaking here. Jesus said this. Look at this very closely. If I do not the works of my father, what? Believe me not. He said in verse 38, he said, but if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works. He said, that ye may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. If I do not the works of the father, believe me not. But if I do, even if you don't understand my packaging, believe the works. If you don't understand me as a person, believe the works. The work is the evidence of the content of the one that is operating. It's very important that we recognize that this is God's ordination. And Jesus said, as the heavenly father has sent me, so send I you. John 17, 18. And what does the Bible say concerning you and concerning me? We are made to understand very clearly. It says there in John chapter 4 and verse 48, we are told there, he said, if, if he said, you will not believe except you see signs and wonders. So it is the evidence of the supernatural that brings about our ability to represent God adequately on the earth. Shout hallelujah. I say shout hallelujah. If people are not convinced by your evidence, it is simply because there are not sufficient proofs to what is being said. God's servant has always made this statement. Only fools doubt proofs. Where there are proofs, there is not much argument. Where there are proofs, there is not much argument. I pray that from this day onward, your life will be a proof for all to see. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. I said your life will be a proof for all to see. What are we saying? Therefore, we are saying that by redemption, you have been created to operate in the supernatural. You have been ordained to operate as a sign and a wonder. We are saying that that is the only way to validate your, connect, your connectivity with God. And we are saying that it is our ability to discover and understand this that makes it a reality in our lives. Psalm chapter 82, verse 5 to 7. It says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods. And all of you, children of the most high, he said, but he shall die like men. Somebody say, God forbid. And fall like the princes. Say, God forbid. You see, what is God saying here? He's saying the problem with these people is the fact that they do not know or understand their identity. They don't know or understand their identity. The discovery of what redemption has made you is the foundation of supernatural living. If you are going to walk in the supernatural, you must have a rediscovery of your redemptive identity. That is the foundation of it. Recognizing that you have been redeemed to operate outside of the natural sphere. You have been redeemed to operate in the realm of the supernatural. You see, when this truth dawns upon you, you will reject every kind of natural experience. And you will begin to aspire to supernatural experiences. I see that becoming somebody's experience here. You see what God is simply saying is this. Don't limit yourself by what limits others. Don't limit yourself by what limits others. That others are limited by certain factors does not mean you are to be limited by it. The ego lives on the earth, but the ego defies gravity. Other animals are subjected to it. But even though it is an animal like the others, it, is dom it dominates the force of gravity. You see that there are limitations for others does not make them limitations for you. Have you discovered that we are told concerning the ego that when the wind blows 
and the storm is thickest, the eagle flies highest. What brings other birds down pushes the eagle up because its experience is ordained to be different by its creative identity. What is God saying? There are things that may pull others down. They are designed to push you up by reason of your redemptive identity. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 and 2. It said that the time comes when the earth will burn like an oven. And all the proud and all that do wickedly, wickedly they shall be as stubble. He said the day that comes will burn them up. And it will not leave them root or branch. Verse 2. He said, but unto you that fear my name. The son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And while others are burning down. Others are going down. Others are self-destructing. What will happen? He said you will go forth. That is you will be going forward. He said, and you will grow up as cows in the storm. Others burn down, you grow up. Others go back, you go forward. That is what God has ordained by redemption. Because that is your supernatural identity in Christ. I see that becoming somebody's experience here in the name of Jesus. Now, having said that, it becomes important for us to know how do we operate the supernatural? If we have a supernatural identity in Christ, then how do we operate the supernatural? Let's recognize that the kingdom of God, the supernatural realm of life, is operated by spiritual forces. Matthew 11 verse 12 says, it tells us there that from the time of John the Baptist, he said the kingdom of God suffers violent and the vow violence and the violent take it by force. So it means that every portion of what we we are to experience in redemption requires spiritual forces. What are some of these forces? We are going to look at two of them tonight before we rise to pray. Number one is the force of divine presence. The force of what? Come on, say it louder. The force of what? The presence of God is the secret of signs. Wherever you see signs at work, what you are seeing is God at work. You see, the word sign refers to pointer. That is why you, you see what we call signboard. What is a signboard doing? It is showing you the way to something or somewhere. It is a pointer to something. Signs are simply pointers to God at work. They are evidences of divine presence. If you want to be a sign commander, you must be a God carrier. Everyone that knows how to move with God cannot lack in signs. Wherever God moves, signs go. This is why it becomes vital and important for us to recognize that one of the foundational secrets to a life of the supernatural is the carriage of divine presence. The man that does not lack the tangible presence of God will not lack tangible proofs in life. If you want to see God at work, make sure you are carrying God wherever you go. Taking the presence of God is the secret to enjoying the power of God. Those who take God's presence see God's power. You can't separate his presence from his power. Wherever his presence goes, his power shows. And that is why it becomes important for us to recognize that a vital secret to a life of the supernatural is recognizing the necessity to carry divine presence. In the book of Psalm chapter 114 verse 1 to 8, we are told there, the Bible says, that when Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a, from a people of a strange language, he said Israel was his dominion and Judah was his sanctuary. And what happened? The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. He said, the mountains keep like rams, and the little hills like lambs. He said, what ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fledest? And thou Jordan, that thou was driven back. 
And thou, ye mountains that you skip like rams, and ye little hills like lambs. What did he say? Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. What everything was reacting to was God's presence. What everything was reacting to was God's presence. Every time God shows up, signs go forth. Every time God shows up, signs go forth. God simply came down in the camp of Israel and suddenly signs and wonders began to manifest everywhere. If you want to see wonders, then simply secure the presence of the God of wonders. The Bible says that he doeth wonders without number. God never runs out of options. Whenever something seems to close up, just let God show up and the way will show forth. The Bible says that the children of Israel were backed into the Red Sea. The Egyptians coming before them. Everything looked like death was on the scene. And God said to Moses, why are you crying unto me? Tell the people that they go forward. And as they began to go forward, the Bible says that the sea divided. And that is where they began to ask the question in Psalm 114, what happened to you, sea, that you divided? What is it that you saw that made you divide like this? Is it that you saw multitude come and say, no, I saw only one person. That person was Jehovah. And when the sea saw him, it divided. When the mountains saw him, they began to skip like rams. When the hills saw him, they began to move around like little lambs. When Jordan saw him, it was driven back. And what was the cause of it? Tremble thou, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. There is nothing known to the earth that does not fear God. There is nothing known to the earth that does not fear God. When it comes to whatever you see or face on the earth, the one thing that terrifies it is God. This is why the Isaiah said in Isaiah 64 verse 1 and verse 2, he said, The all that thou wouldest rend the heavens and come down. He said that the mountains might flow at thy presence. You see, what men call difficulty are what God sees as simplicities. God liquefies man's difficulties. When he comes down, he said, the mountains will flow at thy presence. He said, like when the melting pot burneth and makes the waters to boil, so let your adversaries tremble at thy presence. The power of God's presence is the answer to everything that stands as an opposition in life. You know, when he talks there about the melting pot, He's talking about how you put metal into fire. And you find that these blacksmiths can turn metal into liquid in the midst of fire. So the thing that the blacksmith is struggling to bend, that his power cannot bend, the fire turns it into water. And he simply puts it inside the mold to shape it into whatever shape he wants it to be. You see, what you are facing as a challenge, as an opposition, when you bring it into the, into the vicinity of God's presence, that mountain turns into water. You can turn it to any shape that you want it to be. Is somebody getting what God is saying tonight? The presence of God is the fountain of signs. The presence of God is the fountain of signs. So when a man carries God's presence, his presence command signs and wonders when he carries god's presence in zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 he said the lord in the midst of thee is mighty he will save he will rejoice over thee with, with singing he said he will rest in his love and he will joy over thee with singing he is mighty the lord in the midst is mighty and when he begins to manifest he turns around everything that people have been struggling with. Jump to verse 19 of that scripture and see what it tells us there. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that haunted. I will gather her that was driven out. I will get them praise and fame in every land that they have been put to shame. 
He said, and at that time I will bring you again. Even in that time I will gather you for I will make you a name and a praise. Among all the people of the earth, when I turn back your captivity before your eyes. What is God saying? When his presence comes down, you begin to watch happenings like you are outside and watching a film of yourself. God takes over. It begins to manifest on your behalf and signs begin to occur on your behalf. That will be somebody's experience here. The things that your struggle could not deliver, his presence will deliver for you. You believe it? Say louder, amen. I said his presence will deliver for you. His presence will deliver for you. His presence will deliver for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's presence on its own is potent enough to deliver signs and wonders. But beyond that, we discover that the presence of God also empowers you as a believer to be a commander of signs and wonders. So when God's presence shows up, signs take place. But when a man carries God's presence, he himself becomes empowered by God to be a commander of signs. Shout hallelujah. I said, shout hallelujah. In Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, we are told there concerning the man Paul, the apostle, he said, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. He has empowered his hands. So that from his body were taken to the sick. Are you saying now? This man carried God's presence. So whatever they took from him carried God's power. From his body were taken to the sick handkerchiefs and hip aprons. And the diseases departed from them and evil spirits went out of them. Are you seeing what God is showing us here? The man carried God. So whatever touched him took God's power from him to deliver somewhere else. It empowered him for signs and wonders. That would be somebody's experience now. If you are the one, say louder, amen. I said, if you are the one, say louder, amen. If you are the one, say louder, amen. If you are the one, say the loudest, amen. That's what it means. So, you, you are empowered by God. We are told concerning the man, um, Peter, in the book of Acts chapter 5, beginning from verse 12 all the way down to verse 16, he said God began to wrought all kinds of miracles, and he did that by the hands of the apostles, and as a result of that, he said they began to gather people from everywhere, the villages round about. And what was the reason? That wherever Peter would pass, his shadow might overshadow some of them. And look at what the Bible says in verse 16. And they were healed, everyone. They were just hoping that the shadow would reach some people. The shadow may not have had much distance, but what was inside of him was able to reach everyone. And they were healed, everyone. The man carried God until everywhere he went, he took what God carried and distributed it into lives. That will be somebody's experience from now. What God carries will become your own content to distribute in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the question really now becomes, what does it take to secure divine presence? It's important to note that divine presence is secured and sustained by doing always the things that please God. It is secured and sustained by doing always the things that please God. In the book of Acts, in the book of John chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus speaking said, he said, My, he that sent me is with me. My father has not left me alone. Why? Because I do always the things that please him. I do always the things that please him. In Mark chapter 16, in verse 20, after Jesus had commanded in verse 15 that they should go and preach the gospel to all creatures, in verse 20 we are told, and they went everywhere, doing that which pleased him. And the Lord also, walking with them, confirming the word with signs following. They did what pleased him, and God gave them his presence. He went with them. Anytime you are going for God, God is going with you. That's the meaning of it. Whenever you are going for God, God is going with you. You see, the natural man sends you on errand because he cannot go himself. But God sends you on an errand because he wants to go with you. 
He accompanies those that he sends. There is no man that is on assignment for God that does not carry the presence of God. God goes with those he sends. Anytime the assignment of God is the direction of your life, the presence of God becomes the experience of your life. If you want to take God everywhere, do what God says everywhere. If you do what he says everywhere, you will not lack him anywhere. Simply going to do what God says everywhere is the secret to taking God everywhere. I pray that for each one of us tonight, the grace to remain consistent in our obedience to God be granted to each one of us in the name of Jesus. Any sensitive Christian knows, anytime you are walking in obedience to any instruction, you, will, you can sense that God has left you. It's as though there is a, a removal of the cloak of his presence. But when you are in the center of his agenda, the center of his plan, there is a cocoon of his presence. There is a security even where people are afraid. There is a calmness in the midst of what others see as storms. Because you are too sure of his presence. Is somebody getting what God is saying? The psalmist put it this way. He said, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. While others are afraid and are, and are shaken, I am simply confident because of your presence. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. That is the secret of a life of science. Number two, we have looked at the first one, which is divine presence. Number two force is the force of boldness. The force of boldness. If you are going to operate in the supernatural, boldness is an absolute necessity. In our context here, boldness refers to an open declaration of faith without any doubt in the heart. An open declaration of faith without any doubt in the heart. Mark 11 and verse 23. The Bible tells us there. It said, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. So God is making it clear there that when we are talking about this subject, we are talking about speaking openly without doubting in your heart. There are people who say many things with their mouth. But what determines the power of what your mouth is saying is what your heart is saying. If you doubt in your heart, you cannot take anything from God. James chapter 1 verse 6 and verse 7. He said there, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He said, let not that man think he can receive anything from the Lord. You can't take anything from God if doubt is there. If doubt is there. And the word doubt simply means double mind. Double mind. Somebody who's, who, he believes, he's afraid. He believes, he's afraid. He believes, he's afraid. That's doubt. He trusts God, he's afraid in case something happens. He trusts God, he's afraid in case something happens. That's, that's doubt. Two minds. The moment a person is of two minds, no matter what they say with their mouth, it has been paralyzed by their heart. So if you are going to be a commander of science, you must be a carrier of boldness. Do you know what David said when Goliath came? He said, let no man's heart faint him. Let no man's heart trouble him. This is a young boy. This is a giant that has been, in no, it, that is warfare was his own play. Are you getting what I'm saying? When they said children were going to play group, Goliath, it is war that he went to do his own play. So the only thing he knows how to do is to fight. Can you imagine about a nine feet fighting machine of a human being and then a normal size 17 year old boy coming not with sword and with shield but coming with catapult. Coming with catapult to the war front, to a man that the only thing he knows how to do is to kill. That is his specialty. Killing is his, he was a killing machine. 
And here comes a boy and then he says, listen, nobody should be afraid. Let nobody's heart trouble him. Saul was very concerned. He said, we are, we are troubled. You, no matter how you say it, we are all troubled. He, he put every weapon on him. He said, look, I've not tried this one, but this catapult you are seeing like this. When I fire it, the last time I fired, a lion came down. The next one I fired, a bear came down. This okay, uncircumcised Philistine is the next. Do you know that before he went to fight, he was already settling his reward. He said, what shall be done for the man who kills him? In other words, I didn't go to try. When I come back, I want to come and collect my reward. Is somebody getting it there? There was no fear inside his heart. He was not going as a sacrificial lion. Lamb. He was going as a conquering lion. A bold heart is a vital key for the supernatural. He came and the man said, do you think I'm a dog? That you have come to fight with me with his staff and his, and, and, his, and his link? You know, the natural person, when he looks at his weapon and looks at the opposition, fear will enter his heart. But check what Goliath said and check what David said. David spoke about three times the length of what Goliath said. When he finished, he started. And he started talking up to the point of his burial. That we are going, I will, not, I will kill you. All of your friends, I will kill all of them. We will now feed their flesh to the birds of the air. Your head, I will carry it. I will cut it off. He began to describe the detail of the victory. Because of the boldness of his heart. Is somebody getting what God is saying? You see, when a person's heart is inoculated with boldness, you are not intimidated by the opposition. Is somebody getting it? If you look at Psalm 27, you will understand how David thinks. Psalm 27 from verse 1 to 3. Look at it very closely. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He said, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom, who is it that deserves for me to be afraid of? He said, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foe, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. He said, even though a horse should encamp around me, in, he said, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. The man said, I, I have seen man eaters and I've destroyed them. I've seen people kill us. I've destroyed them. Because God is the strength of my life. This was a man that understood the principle of boldness. I'm not talking bold face. I mean boldness. That somebody shout does not mean it's bold. Is somebody getting it? I mean critical boldness. The boldness that speaks and nothing shakes inside the heart. I pray tonight that that spirit of boldness will come afresh upon you. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. I said somebody believe it, say louder, amen. Somebody believe it, say the loudest, amen. Somebody believe it, say the loudest, amen. If you want to command signs, you must be bold. You must be bold. You must be willing to confront what others fear. You must be bold. Look at God's servant, our father. One of the things you see around him is intense boldness. He speaks with audacity, with authority. He speaks daring the enemy. That's what it takes to command signs. You don't talk as if you are guessing and expect to see signs. No. You speak with the authority and the assurance of faith that what you are saying must come to pass. Shout hallelujah. I see grace coming upon somebody for it. Now it's important to understand that we are empowered for boldness by the Holy Ghost. If you want your chicken heart to be turned to a lion heart, what you need is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Ghost comes upon the life of a person, he energizes him with boldness. Look at the example of Peter. Matthew 26, verse 69 to 75. Peter was intimidated at the time of the death of Christ to the point that he denied him three times. But suddenly, this same Peter stands in Acts chapter 2 after the Holy Ghost had come down and was confronted by the entire nation of Israel and their leadership. And here comes Peter standing strong to defend the gospel. 
They said, speak no more in this name in chapter 5. The Bible tells Peter, said, we cannot but speak. Whether we should begin to obey God or obey you, that's your business. But we cannot but speak of the things that we have both heard and we have seen. They said in chapter 5, he said, we, we, you are, we told you not to speak in this name and you have filled Jerusalem with your gospel. They intimidated them. They did all they could. But the Bible shows us that these men's hearts were unbreakable. Their hearts were unshakable. And that's why you saw signs and wonders following. Shout hallelujah. Now take note in Acts chapter 4 we are told that they went and prayed and asked for one thing in particular from verse 23 to 33. Grant that with boldness your servants will be able to speak your word. Not just speak your word, but do it with what? Boldness. And what was the result of it? In chapter 33, in verse 33, we are told there, he said, and with great power they gave witness, and great grace was upon them. When boldness came, power followed. So signs and wonders answer to boldness, and this boldness comes upon us as a result of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you read that scripture from verse 30 to 33, after they had prayed, the place where they were was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And then suddenly, the power of God began to manifest. Boldness began to show forth and signs began to follow up. I see that becoming each one of our experience in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody believe it, say loud amen. I said somebody believe it, say loud amen. So we are empowered for boldness by the Holy Ghost, but we engage boldness by speaking boldly, speaking with authority. Acts chapter 14 and verse 3, it's a long time about thee, speaking boldly in the Lord, who gave testimony to the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Speaking boldly. So we must begin to as we stand engaging the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, we must begin to engage that boldness by our speaking. Is somebody getting it? Engage it by our speaking. You hear God say all the time, I can never be sick. And there are people who say, ah, don't talk like that. Oh, don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. You know, this world that we're in, there are different kinds of diseases, all kinds of germs, viruses moving everywhere. In fact, if you shake somebody, you never know what it is that has come. So don't say, don't talk like that. What is affecting that person? He lacks boldness. He lacks boldness. Now, he has seen the scripture, but he's not ready to make an open declaration. Is somebody getting it? We hear him say all the time, I can never be poor. And they say, how can somebody be talking like this? He shouldn't be saying this kind of things. But hear this. The Bible says, open your mouth wide and I will feel it. What you cannot openly declare, you cannot ceaselessly take delivery of. You see, it is what you say that you pick. If you can't speak it, you can't pick it. So speak boldly. Is somebody getting it now? Speak boldly. you find what God's word says. Declare it boldly. That's the way to signs. That's the way to wonders. Speaking it boldly. I see grace coming upon each one of us for it. In the name of Jesus Christ. And like we have said, the key is simply the empowerment and the endowment of the Holy Spirit. Lift your right hand up to heaven and thank God for his word that you have received tonight. Thank him. Father, thank you for your word that we have received tonight. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Before we go further tonight, we're going to be praying very shortly. But before we do that, if you are here tonight, you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. You have not made him the Lord and Savior of your life. It doesn't matter how long you have been in church, you are not yet in touch with God. Both here at the youth chapel and across every one of our zones, I want to pray with you this opportunity to have a genuine relationship with God. One that will have evidence and proofs. Wherever you are, quickly rise your feet. I want to pray with you. Very quickly rise on your feet. I want to pray with you. You say, I want to surrender to Jesus. I want to become a child of God. I want to begin to experience the reality of this genuine walk with God that we have proofs to show. Very quickly rise on your feet. God bless you. 
Also, there are those who are here who need to rededicate their lives to Jesus. Something has gone wrong. You have missed it somewhere. And you need to start afresh. You have not done the things that please God. And you want to realign yourself so that you can begin to walk with God. Wherever you are also, quickly rise your feet. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus? Quickly on your feet everywhere. God bless you. On your feet everywhere. God bless you. On your feet everywhere. God bless you. In every zone, every location, quickly on your feet. God bless you. If you have done that, responding to the first or the second call, I want you to quickly make your way towards the altar. We are going to be praying together here. Quickly make your way towards the altar as we pray together here. God bless you. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody, as they come from everywhere. It's worthy of praise. It's worthy of glory. Don't be left behind. Join the others here. Jesus is saving, delivering, and setting free. Keep clapping. Jesus is still drawing them. Still saving, still delivering. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you are still coming, you can do that quickly and join us as we get set to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, Lord. Now, suspend filling your form for a moment and just lift up your right hand and pray this prayer after me. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight as a sinner. I cannot help myself, but I know you died for me on the third day you rose again just to save me. Jesus, come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Take control of me. From this day forward, I will follow you. No turning back. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let your hand be lifted. Father, thank you today for each of these precious ones. They have come today in response to your call. Lord, I ask that the grace that has brought them will keep them walking with you all the days of their lives. No turning back for any one of them. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Congratulations. It's a new day for you. Please just go with the kingdom friends. They will direct you. And after you're concluded with them, you'll be able to go back to your seat. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody. It's worthy of praise. Shall we rise on our feet, everyone? Lift your hand to heaven right now. Take grace from God. Lord, I receive the grace to sustain your presence. I receive the grace to operate with boldness. Lift your voice and pray that prayer from the depth of your heart. From the depth of your heart. Officials, please, let's get to the tables. Pray that prayer from the depth of your heart. I receive grace. I receive grace. I receive grace. I receive grace to sustain your presence in my life. To sustain your presence in my life. I receive that grace this evening. I receive the grace to operate with boldness. To operate with boldness. It's a long time. They are both speaking boldly in the law. I receive that grace tonight. I receive that grace tonight. I receive that grace tonight. Are you praying? Are you praying that prayer? Are you praying that prayer? Receive that grace from God tonight. It is available. It's obtainable. It's accessible. Lift up your voice and take grace from God. Lift up your voice and take grace from God. Lift up your voice and take grace from God. Father, thank you. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Now, the scripture said that he that eats my flesh, Jesus speaking, and drinks my blood, he said, he shall live by me or live like me. So upon this table is the same grace that was in Jesus. Jesus never lacked the presence of God once. And Jesus spoke boldly at every turn, commanding signs. That grace is available here. And as you partake of this table, it will manifest in your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And should there be anything tormenting your body, afflicting your system, anything that is contending for your body, by this communion tonight, the siege is over. I said the siege is over. I said the siege is over. In the name of Jesus Christ. Stretch your hand as we bless the table. Now Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare this table blessed. And by extension, every table served in every location. 
Blessed as the blood and the flesh of Jesus. As we partake of it right now. Grace to live like you, Jesus. Let it be made available to each one of us. Grace to sustain divine presence. Grace to manifest heavenly boldness. We receive it from this night. And by this table, we nullify every affliction. We destroy every torment in anybody. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Take advantage of this opportunity and surely you shall be blessed. R lift your hand one more time and glorify the name of the Lord from the depth of your heart. Glorify his name. Celebrate his faithfulness. Glorify his name and celebrate his faithfulness. Glorify his name and celebrate his faithfulness. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. From this day onward, Signs and wonders shall become your credentials. Every faint-heartedness, an end has come to it forever. The presence of God shall be palpable around your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, so shall it be. In Jesus' precious name. Let us share the goodness and personalize it. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Peace. I have dominion. And I take dominion. Congratulations. Amen and amen. Congratulate somebody as you go and be blessed.